Before we start, if you're enjoying these conversations, please make sure that you like or subscribe to Cleaning Up. It really helps other people to find us. Cleaning Up is brought to you by the Liebreich Foundation and the Gilardini Foundation. Hello, I'm Michael Liebreich and this is Cleaning Up. My guest today is David Sandelo. David is the inaugural fellow at the Center on Global Energy Policy at the School of International and Public Affairs at Columbia University. He's held senior positions at the White House, State Department, and US Department of Energy, where he served as Acting Under Secretary of Energy and Assistant Secretary for Policy and International Affairs. Let's welcome David Sandelo to Cleaning Up. So, David, welcome to Cleaning Up. Good to be here, Michael. Great to see you. Now, you were at COP26 in Glasgow last week. When did you get back home? Uh, end of the week, uh, end of week two. Um, and I, you know, it, it was great to be there, I have to say. Like many of the people who were there, it was my first international trip since COVID. Um, and it was great to see people from all around the world um, who I've worked with for many years on this issue. And I, I took more COVID tests um, than I've ever taken. Uh, that was, but it was very reassuring, I have to say, to know that everybody in that convention hall was getting a negative test every day before they walked in. Well, I bet you were glad to get home because, of course, had you tested positive, it's not just you'd have been confined to your hotel room. You would not have been flying home for ten days or so. You bet. You bet. So I, I think you know what happened to me, which is I went up. I did this tremendous climate action solution center out at the Blair Estate, which I understand you visited. Uh, the first week, just triumphant, the conversations, the people, you know, this was the doers cop and we were at the heart of it. And then after a week, my wife came up to visit and she tested positive and I basically missed the second week after all that. Oh, I, I, how's she doing, Michael? She's good. She's good. She's absolutely, you know, she's recovered. She's tested negative. Uh, you know, like we're all doing tests every day now. And we've, we've had a, we, we, since, since that middle weekend, pretty much we've been testing negative. Um, but uh, but you made it out to the Climate Action Solutions Centre. So that was good. You saw the Blair Estate, the castle. Really remarkable, I have to say. First, the physical setting was beautiful, just extraordinary castle. And then the dialogue was really <laughs> Tremendous. Which day, can I ask which day you were there for? Uh, Wednesday, I believe. And that was uh, what was the what was the topic? Ge- it's geopolitics, and we had a well, very good, very good discussion on the geopolitics, both the, involving Russia and China, um, and, and then in the U.S. and what the domestic politics in the U.S. are doing as well. It was it was just it was a tremendous group, very well moderated, and it was the only uh, missing element was you, Michael. But we had, we managed to have a good conversation without you. Would have been better with you there. Yep. You're very kind. You're very kind. But I understand that the folks from Atlantic Council would just did a, you know, just knocked it out of the park day after day. Uh, But it's a great segue, geopolitics, um, because I want to actually start with, you know, the sort of David Sandlow potted history of his involvement in COPs, because you, I understand, were at COP1. I was a member of the U.S. delegation as part of the White House staff at COP1, Michael. That's absolutely right. And uh, a good trivia question is who for for your audience is who was the chair of cop one uh and the answer was a young very uh talented and promising environment minister named angela merkel uh who did a tremendous job uh as uh the chair of this conference which was in berlin um and then i spent much of the 90s as a climate negotiator uh, for the u.s government and i have to say those were some of the most sleep deprived uh, stressful experiences of my life. You know, there's this culture at the cops among the negotiators of staying up all night in negotiations and and then staying past the deadline for another night of endless negotiations. Um, and I was thinking of writing something actually called A Tale of Two Cops uh, in contrasting that culture within the government negotiators with the rest of the world that kind of comes and releases reports, it, it does, you know, dinners like the kind, the fabulous ones you were doing, makes big announcements, um, but isn't dragged into all these, you know, interminable negotiations. Yeah, so I talk about three cops. Every cop is actually three cops. Ah. There's the kind of the negotiator cop, um, which is all about the the dots and the commas and the square brackets and the sleepless nights. Then there's the 
activist cop, which is always, this is a terrible waste of time and you've grown up to doing nothing and the die-ins in the streets. And the, and it's actually, I mean, I, I shouldn't be flip. I, should be, I shouldn't be uh, you know, uh, disparaging because actually the civic society keeping pressure on all of us is actually, the, that is the mainspring of why, we, you know, why we've got to the point we've got. But there is a lot of theater around the activism and then there's the kind of what I call the doers cop, which I've seen grow from, you know, the first time that business was invited was, I think, in uh, uh, Warsaw Cop uh, 20, I'm going to say, when there was an actual formal sort of track for business or formal activity set for business. The side events have just gone um, you know, ballistic. And now we're talking about the financiers. You know, I was sort of... Um, it was a bit like an alien abduction. I was suddenly invited to have dinner with Larry Fink in a, a hotel in uh, in Glasgow. That would never have happened five years ago. He just yeah. wouldn't have been there. But there was all these finances. There was business people. There was so much going on. And, you know, the, and so, you know, depending on which of those cops you attended, I think you get a very different picture for what just happened. I've got this very optimistic picture of the most extraordinary progress because I could see... I was with all these people who are, you know, whether it was finance, whether it was hydrogen, whether it was, uh, you know, deep penetration of renewables, whether it was nuclear, whether it was carbon removal, uh, you know, there was just so much happening, you know, real deals, real conversations. I think those are really astute comments and I agree completely. And I think if the standard for your, for measuring the success of a cop is, did we solve global warming? Um, no, uh, we didn't do that. And, and no, no cop is ever going to do that. But did, was real progress made? I, I think real progress was made at COP26. And th that's, it's really, this is, in my view, the point of COPs is to bring forward action like this, to provide a platform for this to happen. And, you know, c climate change is a problem caused by invisible odorless gases. Unless we create events where people need to come forward and be responsible and address the issue, it's going to be much harder to move forward. And I think it's part of the, the whole theory of the Paris Agreement is to create these uh, events where, where, where countries are required to come forward with action. Uh, and then where civil society, you know, businesses, everyone has an opportunity to come forward and do the same thing. And just and you're hearing, I'm, I'm in the streets of New York, so you may be hearing this siren come by. It's not the last time that you, you will hear a siren. Uh, my, my apartment is on Broadway. So you're hearing the sounds of Broadway there. Oh, I, David, I, I, I thought that was your car arriving. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but one comment on the activism, Michael, you know, I, I just want to underline and agree with the point you made that the activists and, and that third cop, which you very correctly point to, the third cop on the streets is really important. Uh, I mean, I, I think that that type of activism is what drives a lot of the agenda and we need it out there. And, um, you know, sober, you know, older people like me and, you know, a little less older like you, you know, may, may sometimes think, oh, my God, they're, they're overstating their you know, case and that type of thing. But I, I think that activism is essential to forward motion on climate change. I, I think there is a danger to that community I and mean, it's not my role to advise them, but I think there is a danger because, the overstating, you know, I, I, at the end, you know, they have to communicate with the greatest sense of urgency, desperation, whatever, uh, you know, to, to be heard. The worry is that actually most people are not aware of some really basic things like emissions have actually peaked. There's some data that came out on the on November the 4th, early in the first week of, of COP that showed that because I've been saying, look, energy emissions have only gone up 2% in the last eight years, despite economic growth. So the energy emissions have nearly peaked. We're pretty much, we're either at or near a peak. It's possible 2019 was the peak. But if you then add in land use, you know, brackets, yes, there's lots of error bars, but actually emissions have peaked a decade ago. And people are blissfully unaware of this out there in the real world. And then, of course, you get this kind of still this steady, you know, drumbeat of promotion of disaster scenarios, which, frankly, the work of people like you over, I mean, I guess in COP once, so we're talking, two, you know, two and a half decades, but also all the investors I've ever worked with, all the entrepreneurs, all of the businesses, we are actually getting a purchase on this problem. We are actually not ended up, we're not going to go off to five degrees, seven degrees centigrade of warming, not even four degrees, and now not even three degrees. And yet there isn't that awareness. And I worry that the activists 
in a way that overstatement, they get locked into overstating the same case. And at some point, it, you know, at some point it's like, look, you've got all these pledges. What the activists need to do is say, deliver the pledges. Not you're doing nothing, but you know, you've, you've made the pledge, now deliver the pledge. And we're going to monitor that rather than say, oh, it's all a catastrophe. Yeah, I, look, I, there's, I don't know that activists in any generation have ever done nuance. I think that you know, <laughs> it, it, it's really important to be out there make, making the case. And, 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 and yeah. uh, we could talk the, about some of the... The difference here, if I might, David, is that these are activists generally who are saying, follow the science. Right. Most activists don't do that. They just activate. They're just activists on their topic. But here you have activists saying, follow the science. And the science has actually moved on. Well, look, I, I think what, what it, uh, Fatih Birol says that if we um, if all of the pledges are fully implemented, we will hold uh, warming to 1.8 degrees C. Yeah. I think was his conclusion. Uh, and, you know, the, the track record since Paris is that countries aren't coming close to following through on all of their pledges. So. I, my bottom line is less optimistic than what you just related. I think we are at serious risk of, you know, dramatically overshooting even the two degree goal of Paris. And certainly the 1.5 degree is, is way out of reach. And, no, I, and the I, science I, I, makes no. clear that, that that is going to lead to you know, significant damage of the kind that we've seen this year, you know, all over the world. So I, I, I wouldn't be sanguine. My, my concern is not doing, you know, too, too little on this topic. I think we haven't begun to grab uh, this problem and solve it in any meaningful way. And, and don't get me wrong, I'm not optimistic. I'm not blindly optimistic. Um, I'm just saying that, you know, we should be realistic about where we are and where we aren't headed. But that's, like I said, that's that's advice to advice to people who, who, whom I'm not sort of, you know, I'm not, I'm not really able to advise. It's just an observation. But there was one real breakthrough, one real piece um, that, uh, of what happened in Glasgow, which must have really resonated with you, which was there came a point where things were looking sticky and the US and China got in a room and came up with this US-China declaration and it was like, well, hang on a second. I've seen this film before, but actually, you you actually were the producer on the film when that happened before the the um, COP twenty one Paris. Again, that was it was about six months before COP twenty one, I think. Um, so this US China axis is really fascinating, and its role in keeping the thing moving forwards. And that's really one of your great specialist topics, isn't it? There's a lot to say about this, Michael. And yeah, I've been going to China since I was young. I um, it was really it was a real privilege back many years ago. I went right out of college. Uh, the uh, U.S. and China normalized relations, and I had always, as a kid, wanted to go to China. It was impossible for an, someone from the United States in, in that period to to even do it. And in the, just to date myself more, in the summer of 1981, I looked around for an exchange program that would get me over to China, and the internet didn't exist back then. Um, but I managed to find a program at Columbia University, uh, where uh, where I now am, and where I was not affiliated in any way at the time. But I I went uh, with the exchange program, spent the summer in Shanghai in the summer of 1991. Incredibly different China, as you can. I mean, we as we flew in, there were no lights at night in the city, and um, and I've been going back ever since. And and for me, uh, I mean, China is an endlessly fascinating uh, country. Uh, the rise of China in the past four decades in my professional life has been, I think, by far the most important geopolitical development of of, that, of, our, of two generations. And, and the U.S.-China relationship now is the most important bilateral relationship in the world, I think, for any two countries. And it's in incredibly fraught and difficult right now. Um, and uh, uh, many people in the climate community looked back to the agreement in 2014. Um, uh, and in, in 2014, um, with great leadership from government, I, I was actually out of the Obama administration by then. I had, um, I was in the Obama administration until from beginning until 2013, um, and spent a lot of that time working on U.S.-China energy relations. We created something called the Clean Energy Research Center, U.S.-China Clean Energy Research Centers, which worked on it cooperatively and a number of different um, clean energy technologies, and, and built up a series of of cooperative efforts to address climate change. And then by, by 2014, um, uh, a bilateral agreement was reached that was signed by or announced by President Obama and President Xi. Uh, it was the first time that, that China 
Chinese government had ever uh, agreed to a, a limit emissions in an absolute an absolute limit on emissions that agreed that was when the agreement to peak in 2030 was announced. Uh, President Obama announced an ambitious target for the United States, and and I think many observers have I've heard say that that provided a key foundation for the Paris Agreement. I've heard Laurence Tubiana say some version of. Um, uh, without the Par- without the U.S. China agreement, it's not clear we would have had the Paris Agreement. So it's really important. Um, all of that brings us to the present, where the U.S. China relationship is incredibly fraught and difficult, filled with tensions. Um, and uh, I think it's really striking that the one issue on which the two governments have been able to reach some agreement to have productive dialogue is climate change, and it's, it's very encouraging, I think. Um, and the, the agreement that was announced in Glasgow is, it's really an agreement to, to talk and to, um, to have constructive dialogue. Um, but even that in the context of the challenging relationship, I think it's important. And the most important and interesting provisions in that agreement, I think are on methane or methane, I think as you say in the UK. Um, uh, and and the, the, the methane uh, provisions uh, are actually quite specific. Um, and the Chinese government agreed to develop a national action plan on methane for the first time. Um, and uh, the two governments set forth a schedule for discussing what to do about this. And obviously, um, methane emissions uh, offer a real opportunity for relatively quick, quickly addressing some climate change issues. So I think there's a lot that's really encouraging there. Right. Well, there's a lot to un- there is a lot to unpack there. I'm sorry, and I had sort of ascribed the success in 2014. I said it was six months before Paris. It was actually a, a year and a, and a bit before. I sort of ascribed that to you because I ad- I identify you so strongly with this U.S. China um, sort of agenda. Uh, and two um, two episodes ago, uh, we actually had Todd Stern and and we've spoken to Laurence Tubiano. I've actually spoken to so many of the people behind the Paris Agreement uh, and this topic of this the role of that. US China sort of, you know, in unblocking that agreement, in unblocking the drains before the Paris Agreement. To what extent, what, what I'm fascinated by in the in in the, the Glasgow um, declaration is why did China not sign up to the methane pledge, which is this sort of multilateral, it was the EU and the US, but then there's a whole bunch of other countries, 30% reduction in methane by 2030, which by the way, I've considered to be completely inadequate and completely unambitious, ridiculously so. But nevertheless, that was the big initiative. But why did China not sign up to that, but then sign up to something sort of methane-y, you know, uh, just literally a few days later as a bilateral with the US? I, d- I don't know the answer to that question, Michael. It's a good one, but here's my speculation. I think that if the Chinese government is never going to sign on to a quantitative pledge that it is not confident it can meet. And my guess is that the analysis had not been done within the Chinese government or the broader intellectual, com- the broader community in China um, on the Ch- Chinese ability to meet that pledge. And I think it's possible that with the work that's going to go on in the next year, um, that Chinese government might come around and actually sign that pledge, um, you know, based upon further analysis, but they just weren't weren't ready to do so. But it's it's fascinating because this is all the kind of the content in the content and context of the climate discussions. I'm always interested in the the meta discussion, you know, that China is very interested in doing bilaterals with the US because it sort of em- emphasizes how important China is, that there are only these two, you know, the, the, the sort of the G2. Is something that China is very keen on promoting. That's my impression. I always want, wonder whether the original um, pledge of net zero 2060 was that mischievously done to drive a wedge between the EU and the US at a time when China was getting a lot of flack because of the Uyghurs, because of Hong Kong. You know, what are the kind of, am I wrong to think that there are these kind of, there's a meta level of, um, in a sense, sort of pros and cons or, or, or benefits that China is playing for that are really not about methane at all, but they're about what conversations they're in and how they're perceived. You know, there, that some of those factors may come into play, but I think that foreigners often tend to overestimate the extent to which they are important in the development of Chinese policy. And, and I think that um, the Chinese government um, is fully 
behind, fully uh, committed to uh, the science of climate change. There are, no, there are no known climate deniers in the Chinese government. They believe climate change is a problem. It's a threat to the country. Um, uh, and, and, and is looking at a way to address climate change consistent with economic development goals. Um, and it's obviously, you know, can be a challenge for any country, for a country that has extraordinarily abundant and cheap coal, uh, it's a particular challenge. Um, and in a country where the, in addition, the legitimacy of the government really depends upon steady economic growth. You know, I think it's an important difference between the Western and Chinese political cultures. We tend to judge the legitimacy of our governments by the consent of the governed. That is not a framework that is part of Chinese political history. That can, the legitimacy is a function of continued economic growth. Um, and, uh, and, and so I, I, I read the 2060 pledge as a commitment to address climate change, which the Chinese government believes is real. Um, uh, it, it's one that, that uh, the, the wheels are starting to turn to get there. It's a long-term process, um, you know, I, but, but, I, but I think it's genuine. Um, I think certainly in the United States, because of our political cycles and the way that our administrations you know, can be so different in their policies, we tend to discount long-term goals because we just don't have the systems to implement them in the United States. We, and we, it's, uh, that's a whole other topic of conversation, um, but, uh, but we don't. You know, in, in, in China, historically, they do. I mean, China's currently on its 14th five-year plan. Um, the Chinese government has what are known as you know, centenary goals, and it, has, it literally has a goal for 2049 um, to be a, a prosperous middle-class society. Uh, and, uh, and so there's a, uh, a planning framework and a planning mentality within the Chinese government that uh, I think you know, it's different than the United States. Can I ask, you say that China is committed to addressing climate change, and there's a number of different reasons why that might be. You know, maybe they have you know, full faith in the science of climate change and they've got plenty of low-lying, you know, Shanghai, et cetera, that's, you know, the, 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 at sea level and therefore there's the actual sort of, in a sense, the, you know, the, 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 the physical reasons. But there's also, um, I mean, you've sort of discounted the diplomatic games potential reason, but there's another one, which is sh addressing climate change does drive a changing of the guards technologically. So from internal combustion engine cars yep. to electric cars. Um, to what extent do you think China's commitment to dealing with climate change is about owning the industries of the future, completely separate to, in a sense, whether it's really happening or not? Is, is there any element of just, you know, of, of that? Absolutely. And, and it's most clear, for example, with electric vehicles. And the Chinese government looked uh, 20 years ago and as it scaled up its you know, auto industry and said, we are never going to be you know, ahead of the West when it comes to internal combustion engines with hit 80 year head start. Well, let's invest in, in electric vehicle sector. Um, and now more than half of the electric vehicles sold in the world last year were sold in China. There's a lot of innovation happening in electric vehicles in China. Um, and, and that's just one example. Um, there are a number of others. So yeah, there's definitely an alignment between seizing markets for clean energy technologies and fighting the climate change problem. And, and, and by the way, I don't want to overly discount the diplomatic imperative, but I didn't mean to suggest that that was absent. Um, and, and in particular, I think the Chinese government is... It, um, concerned about its continued leadership within the G77 is one factor. Um, and there are a lot of poor, you know, low-lying countries that just want the emissions to stop. And uh, I, I remember I, I, one particular incident I remember, it, it, I, I, during the 1990s when I was a climate negotiator, as we discussed, I would often, you know, in, in the halls of these cops be criticized by uh, diplomats from small island states. Um, the United States was the largest emitter at the time. And then I, I didn't go to COPs much in the period when President Bush was in office in the United States, but in 2009 returned as a government official to a COP. And I will never forget talking to the president of a small island state who all he wanted to talk about was criticism of China, not of the United States, because by 2009, China was the world's leading emitter. 
And uh, it was quite a change. And I, I don't think that's a comfortable place for the Chinese government right now. They want to show that they're being proactive in addressing this as part of their diplomatic relationships. Right. But that that's a fantastic segue to something I wanted to bring up, which is, you know, that uncomfortable place just got a whole lot more uncomfortable because China and India insisted on this last minute change in Glasgow from phasing out coal to phasing down coal, which is in many ways you could say, you know, it could be the death knell of some of these low lying island states. And my understanding is they were deeply, deeply uh, unhappy with that. And, you know, sort of um, went yeah. ahead, went, went, you know, went along with the agreement in Glasgow with with huge sense of forebode, foreboding and, and actually anger at China and India for that move. That's quite true. And right, which just shows, I guess, that uh, that imperative did not win out uh, for Chinese diplomats at, at this meeting. That kind of the, the, this was more important to them than staying on the side of their colleagues in the G77 on this issue. But but my, my the favorite comment I've seen about that was from my friend Nat Cohane, who's now at C2ES, and he said climate change is not going to be solved with a thesaurus; it's going to be solved with technologies. And you know, I, I think there is uh, the debate between phase out and phase down, which got a lot of media. Um, that's a reflection of where governments are. It's it's not um, it, that alone is not going to solve the problem. What we need to do is implement and develop and deploy the clean energy technologies, the technologies and other sectors that are really going to solve this problem. Right. No, and I, I agree with you. I, I looked at that, you know, um, that uh, wording question. So, well, you know, I think that you can talk about phasing down, but as soon as you do, your cost of capital goes up, your ability to acquire talent is non-existent. Who wants to, who's going to want to graduate as an engineer and go into coal when it's, whether it's being phased down or phased out is totally irrelevant. It's not where you put your career. Um, so I wouldn't be at all surprised. In fact, we've seen it repeatedly. As soon as a strong signal comes, actually the innovation runs way ahead of the signal itself. And I wouldn't be remotely surprised to see that also on coal. Um, but nevertheless, it was it was interesting to see. And you know, the, the I guess there's this... Um, you know, China wants to show that leadership, but then that was a, a, a that was a you know they definitely um, uh, they definitely didn't make any friends amongst the low lying you know island states uh, you know on, on that count. No question. Yeah. Now, one of the things you talked about the longevity of the plans and the planning system in China. There's also the longevity of a key character, um, Xi Jinhua who has been their negotiator, has been involved, and you've worked very closely with him, and Todd Stern worked closely. I, I don't know how long he's been in place, but he really has uh, has been pretty much a constant in this process for some time, has he not? No, no question. And, and he, you know, he was uh, he had high positions 20 years ago um, as uh, a minister or head of, their, of the domestic environmental agency, and it's been top negotiator now since at least, you know, the middle of the last decade. Um, and uh, yeah, well, um, extraordinarily capable person, um, you know, very, very smart, very articulate, really charismatic often in the way he presents things. Um, and, uh, and, and in my experience, you know, somebody who um, responds thoughtfully to um, to ideas that are proposed from negotiating counterparts and, and clearly says what what he can do and what he can't. And when when you're negotiating, that's what's important. I mean, uh, you know, we've we've I've certainly when I was in government, you know, been, been very frustrated with him at times, but but always respected the you know uh, perspective that he brought to it, um, br brought to the negotiations. Well, m maybe I should try and get him on to uh, cleaning up and get him. Uh, we, yeah. we, we, I've had a, a very interesting Saudi analyst uh, who came on this, uh, Yusuf Al Shamari, young guy, but really smart, very well connected, uh, and I love to get these different perspectives. Uh, on on these questions, and so maybe we can work on that. But in Glasgow at COP, you were also presenting a report because now you, now that you're not in government, you get to kind of do things that you're you know a broader set of things that you're interested in. And yep. you were presenting a report on mineralization of carbon, right? If, yep. if I've understood it right, tell tell everybody what that is because I think that this doesn't get enough airtime. I couldn't agree more, Michael. It's very so. so um, we released a roadmap on carbon mineralization uh, and 
Uh, I have to say, you know, after working in climate change policy for many years, this was a topic I knew almost nothing about until about nine months ago when I started working on this project. And um, assuming that lots of your audience is the same, let me just explain that carbon mineralization is a natural process in which um, carbon dioxide is incorporated into rocks, particularly calcium and magnesium bearing rocks, and turns into carbonate minerals. Uh, and it's a natural process. It happens very slowly. And every year, about 0.3 gigatons of carbon dioxide is removed from the atmosphere as a result of carbon mineralization. So that's, you know, that's what about uh, zero point, it's about 0.6% of overall emissions. Um, I was going to say it's 1% of energy emissions, but 0.6% of energy, 0.6% like of, of overall emissions. Yeah. So the natural, you know, it's, so it's, it, um, Sometimes this is called the slow carbon cycle. It's part of a slow carbon cycle. So what we look at in this in this roadmap is: Are there ways to use this natural process to remove more carbon dioxide from the atmosphere? Um, and if there were, it would be tremendous from a couple of different standpoints. One, this is permanent removal. I mean, you're literally this binds carbon dioxide into rocks. Um, another very important feature is. This doesn't require energy. I mean, this happens naturally. It's, you know, for this is exothermic. The process actually generates heat when you do that. Um, and, and third, these rocks are located all over the world, uh, subsurface and on the surface of the earth. So um, I, I, we. I'll add, David, fourth, it's fabulously benign. They're not yes. radioactive. They're not poisonous. They don't go into the water table. They don't do, they just, it's just, it's just sand or it's just rock, right? Exactly right. In fact, uh, there are ways that this can help manage local environmental problems. So what, what we discuss are a number of different strategies. And, and uh, one of them is take, taking industrial wastes or mining waste, some of which you know, sometimes have uh, metals that can be a problem if they get into water. Um, and uh, uh, there are ways then to, to grind them and make sure that they absorb the carbon and turn into carbonate minerals, which can help manage the local environmental problem and absorb carbon. Um, and if you can do that without spending a lot of energy to grind the rocks, or if you've got rocks that have already been ground because they're part of an industrial process sitting in big waste piles or man mining tailings, you can make it a contribution. This is certainly a strategy that any mining company should be looking at to get to net zero emissions, but, it, but it's even bigger than that, I think. Um, and then there's strategies for pumping water or CO2 enriched water underground into rock caverns that have these types of, that have magnesium and calcium bearing rocks. And then the rocks absorb the carbon dioxide from the water. There's some interesting experience, experiments being done, including one by my Columbia colleague, Peter Kellerman, who's doing this off the coast of Oman. Um, and uh, the main point of our roadmap is this is a topic that doesn't get enough attention. It should get a lot more. We need dozens of pilot projects around the world uh, to explore the potential for using this to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. We need much more attention in R&D programs, incentives, government procurement programs for products that may come out of this. Um, uh, eventually, and maybe soon, we, we could give credit for some of this in, in emissions trading programs. Um, and, and we're just trying to shine a spotlight in this as an opportunity because I just find so, so few people know about it. Oh. No, it's fascinating. The one that I'm aware of is up in Iceland where there's carbon being captured from the air and put into basaltic rocks. I'm not sure if I've pronounced that right. But, uh, yep. but, um, but the problem with that one is, of course, that the, carbon, the capturing the carbon from the air is so ridiculously expensive that, that it just feels like, a, like, like, like a, a, a bit of a kind of, I don't know, uh, what can I call it? Uh, more of a distraction than something real. Uh, but the basaltic rock stuff is really, really interesting. No, I, so yeah. Thank you for mentioning that. That's a called it's a carb fix project up in up in Iceland, and so it's the first time we're, uh, this is being done at that scale. But no, look, I, uh, I would not be as discouraged by the cost of direct air capture as you just suggested. This is you know one of the initial deployments of direct air capture technology. It's very early stage. Uh, the cost of that technology will come down dramatically with increasing deployment, um, and and so I think. Uh, a project like the one in Iceland you mentioned, which can power the removal of carbon dioxide from the air with renewable energy, so in a net zero, and then pump it underground into these rocks is tre tremendously productive. So let's not go down the rabbit hole of direct air capture. I'd love to because um, I'm very concerned that it's being held out by you know as much a much bigger part of the solution than the economics 
um, would would justify. But um, but we will go down a, a rabbit hole on learning curves and where they are and where they might end up. Um, but it's certainly well, just one question. If you look at that sort of, never mind the direct air capture. If you're talking about just grinding the stone and then exposing it to so it's uh, mineralizing with carbon, with, turning into carbonates. Do you get a, in your report? Do you include uh, an estimate of the sort of carbon cost per ton? Do you do you go as far as that? It's going to vary widely. So um, so we don't, and and uh, it, it's currently expensive. This will be expensive, but but I think costs can come down with greater deployment okay. and, and learning and learning curves. One thing we do so th- there's peer reviewed literature that says that this process could be used to get 10 gigatons of carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere every year, and that's obviously a that if that happened, that would be an enormous contributor to getting to net zero emissions. Well, that's a so huge scale up. I mean, that's from 300 uh, million tons to 10. So that's a, that's it, a factors yeah. of, you know, 30, 40 more. Well, also very significantly, this peer reviewed literature does not have any time frames in it. At ah. least we, we were not able to find time frames. So, uh, so, so we then, our, our team um, in this report estimates that with strong policy support and scale up, we could get to one gigaton per year by 2035 and potentially 10 gigatons by, by mid-century. That's not a peer reviewed result. That's something we you know, t- discussed among our expert team and it, it requires more work, but, but, but that's, I think the scale. I think if, if we really have some support uh, from policymakers that could happen. And I want by the way, I wanna note, this is part of a series of roadmaps that have been done in connection with the ICEF conference, the Innovation for Cool Innovation for Cool Earth Forum, and if you, uh, which is a conference hosted by the Japanese government every year, um, and uh, we've done a series of roadmaps. And if you're interested in this topic, you can find the report at icef-forum.org. I mean, we'll, add a, we'll add a link, David, in the show notes. No problem with Wonderful. doing that, of course. We'll put a yeah. link in the show notes. And I will say that, you know, I'm aware of this because, you know, I got I went down the rabbit hole a little while ago looking for olivine. Olivine is one of the rocks that can absorb this uh, CO2. And yep. I wanted to buy olivine sand, which I could strew over my garden. But, you know, I want a few hundred kilos of it. And there, there are no olivine sand retailers in the UK, I can tell you that. But, you oh. know, you're you're working on uh, also um, food and climate change. We had the great privilege of having uh, your Secretary of Agriculture, Tom Vilsack, also came to the Blair Estate, not on the same day as you. And we talked about agriculture. And um, and my sense was, if you look at all the other sectors, energy, transport, aviation, the difficult to uh, decarbonize sectors and so on, they were all basically saying, We will do what we can. We'll get our emissions down near to zero, but not quite zero. And then we'll do some offsets. And those offsets will broadly be in agriculture and forestry, which will have to go negative. But Hmm. nobody's told the agriculture sector. Is that fair? Well, look, I I think, I'll tell you why I've been paying attention to this. As as we've discussed, I've been doing climate change policy for many years, uh, but mainly with an energy focus. And I have started reading couple of years ago on this topic and came across the the statistic that 30% of global greenhouse gas emissions come from the food system, 30%. And I've been to lots of meetings where the power sector is discussed, the uh, transport sector is discussed, but food system emissions are not on the table, so to speak. And I thought that was an oversight and that, that more attention needed to be paid to this. So along with some colleagues here at Columbia and at New York University at, and, and at the Food and Agriculture Organization, we've created something called the Food Climate Partnership. And, and also for your program notes, you can go to foodclimatepartnership.org and read more about what we're doing. Um, I think in some ways, although that statistic seems large, 30% of greenhouse gas emissions, in some ways it's not surprising since everybody on the planet eats food every day, or most almost everybody does. We hope everybody does. And so a lot of the infrastructure that we have in the world relates to what we all do every day, which is eating food. And, and so that 30% in, uh, includes clearing of forests for, for agricultural production and includes fertilizers. It includes the emissions from, you know, um, night, uh, from machinery and for agricultural production it includes the shipment of food, um, uh, refrigeration of food, cooking of food, and then disposal of food. So that entire chain, um, goes light. And so we're looking at a food systems approach 
um, and have a number of, of uh, articles looking at the emissions and, and thinking about how you think about this holistically in a way that might reduce emissions. Um, one, and I had one particular piece of this that, that I think is important, but very politically fraught um, involves um, livestock production. And, and livestock production is a major contributor to greenhouse gas emissions, in particular methane emissions from livestock. Mainly comes out of the front end of livestock, by the way, not the back end of livestock. Um, uh, but um, but there's a couple of so, so reducing consumption of beef is absolutely a strategy for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, there's at least two observations I'd make about that from a social cultural standpoint. First is I don't think that that there is any moral basis for preventing anyone in you know, uh, poverty or you know, in poor countries from moving towards more livestock consumption. I and mean, I think the notion of people from wealthy countries saying that people in poor countries, you shouldn't eat beef after we've you know, jet for generations prospered from that, I, I don't think is even remotely appropriate. Um, and, and then beyond that, even in developing countries where people eat way too much beef, actually. Deve even, developed, you mean? I'm sorry, developed. Sorry, thank you. In developed countries, this is, uh, we, I don't know if you, we say a third rail in U.S. policy, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's too hot to touch. Um, and uh, people don't want to be told that not, not to eat beef. So it's a very, it's a very challenging topic. Um, th yeah. There's interesting technological solutions. I mean, there's this uh, plant-based proteins, which, you know, um, uh, look and feel like, like hamburgers and, and work on cellular beef. So there's a lot here. And I think this neat... I, I, I've rambled a lot without addressing your specific question uh, about, I think you're right, that the agriculture sector, um, you know, is, is not um, uh, moving in quite the same way. Um, and we need a variety of technological solutions in order to uh, have the agriculture sector be part of the net zero emission story. It's, it's a ferociously complex space where, you know, I think, I certainly don't feel qualified to you know, to have a point of view, which is quite rare for me, as I'm sure you you're, you know, you will appreciate. Yeah. Um, because it, it, so much of the solutions lie in agricultural systems, and you know your average climate wonk is urban, um, has studied at an urban university, probably grew up in a city. Uh, how many how many of us really understand? the sort of farming system, farming way of life, or even, frankly, the ecology of agricultural and mixed-use land. Um, I, I don't, I, you know, I've been trying to learn about this space for about, I would say, five years, reading everything I can. And my main conclusion is it's really complicated. Um, and anybody who says the answer is X is just wrong. So if they say, well, the answer is don't eat meat or reduce meat consumption, then you get all of these counter arguments about how um, how the ungulates and the, how the you know the larger animals are, are needed for a healthy ecology. Um, now, right. you know, we, we obviously have a, a, a lack of large predators, so we have to play that role. But a landscape that has no um, no ungulates is is also not a healthy one, and it's not capturing carbon. So it's it's a it's such a complex. Um, and, and culturally fraught, as you say, you've got the vegans who are always younger and urban and think they know everything. And then you've got the farmers and they're always older and rural and they also think they know everything. And there are very, very few discussions between those two groups that aren't just name calling. Well, if you want, I, uh, if you agree with all that, Michael, if you want a short summary of this, anyone listening, we, I wrote something about a year ago called the, the Food and Climate Change Info Guide. It's about 20 pages where we try to just summarize some of the basic facts um, to get people started. And there's a and I would say, come to our website at foodclimatepartnership.org. There are some, you know, amazing experts who are, you know, devoting their lives to these issues. Um, and uh, some of my colleagues said, you know, really call out Cynthia Rosenzweig at Columbia, Francesco Tubiello at the Food and Agriculture Organization, Matthew Hayek at NYU. They're they're all doing, and many others are, are doing tremendous work uh, in, in this area. Right. Well, when I next come over to the U.S., maybe I'll time it so that I can participate and, and, and continue my education, because it really is nothing more than that, and my involvement in, in, in that space. Um, yeah, I feel it much, much, I'm much more comfortable saying when, or, when you will or won't get an electric uh, a tractor or whether you need to do a hydrogen tractor and those sorts of things. That's kind of my, you know, I'm OK there. Um, but 
I'm just conscious of time. There's another uh, topic that I, and you know, that we'll put all those in the show notes. Another topic that I know that you're working on and, uh, and is maybe a little bit more in my wheelhouse, which is um, vehicle to grid. So yep. I mean, a huge range of stuff you do, but tell us about what you're doing on vehicle to grid. I think it's a really exciting area right now. So I've served on the board for of a vehicle to grid company for many years. Uh, the name we is need to tell, David. Just we need to tell the audience. Some of them are as wonky as you and me, and some of them won't have a clue what we're talking about with vehicle to grid. Uh, Maybe start with a definition and then but, then go back to your thoughts. Thank you. So so the idea here is that electric vehicles can. Um, be enabled to not just take electricity from the electric grid, but also return electricity to the grid or to a home or to a business. Um, And it's quite simple to do that. Um, The battery is discharging anyway in the vehicles, discharging to the wheels essentially. Um, And it can be enabled to discharge off the vehicle and into uh, an external source. And and the um, pure, once there are, many electric vehicles out on the road, the energy storage capacity in those, elect- in those electric vehicles is extraordinary um, and, uh, and, and can do lots of um, things for the electric grid and for homes. I mean, uh, we have huge challenges, for example, in terms of balancing renewable power and uh, variable renewable power like solar and wind power. And a lot of effort is going into developing storage and cheap storage in order to help do that we've got a lot of storage capacity in these vehicles and maybe there are ways to enable these vehicles to help balance solar and wind power on the grid. This can also be, a, could be a tremendous asset uh, for energy, for resilience and, and protecting against blackouts. We had you know, terrible blackouts in Texas in the United States, you know, earlier, earlier this year, um, people were without power for, you know, three days. If, if they had an electric vehicle in their home that could power their house, some of the worst outcomes could have been avoided. Now, this is a bit of a moment for this. The, the, right now, the uh, Ford Motor Company has a pickup truck that is the best-selling vehicle in the United States. It's called the Ford F-150 pickup truck. Right. A- and Ford has announced an electric F-150 pickup truck, uh, which is uh, wildly oversubscribed. It's going to be in showrooms soon. Um, and this electric F-150 cu- pickup truck is bi-directional. You can use it to... Um, power appliances at a campsite, or if a lot of F-150s are used at work sites, construction sites, you can use it to power tools at a work site, or uh, you can keep your home, an average American home could be powered for about three days with the battery, with this capacity in an F-150. And Ford is marketing this uh, very heavily as a feature of the F-150. So I, I think we're at a moment where the borderline between the transport sector and the power sector is being eroded. Um, and we're going to, and this area broadly of vehicle grid integration is going to be really important um, in the years ahead. I'm, I'm really excited about it. So yeah, and all of the, just for for a sort of scale perspective, all of the uh, scenarios and models, uh, whether it's Bloomberg NEF or whether it's the IEA or whether it's the EIA, whatever, all of the forward-looking um, actually EIA doesn't really do a kind of climate uh, a, a kind of one and a half degrees or a, a deep. Um, uh, you know, a, a, a deep low carbon scenario, but all the people who do, DMV, GL, uh, BP, Shell, the storage is always in the 80%, 90% of the storage is in vehicles. It's uh, not grid, there is some grid connected, but most of it is going to go into vehicles. Most of all of the batteries, all the lithium ion, whatever, solid state, it's all going to go into the a big chunk of it into vehicles. But I was always skeptical about vehicle to grid this idea that you would power your home or something or your tools out of the vehicle. Um, I always thought you, you, there's no question you need smart charging. So you can't have everybody come home from their you know, day of work or at college and plug in just at the point when the sun goes down and there'll be this huge spike of demand on the, on the grid. So I thought smart charging, yes, but vehicle to grid, no, because you know, my calculation was very simple. I said, look, the battery costs, you know, $40,000 and you get a thousand cycles. So each cycle costs you $40. You do $40 of damage to your, to your battery each time you do a cycle. And therefore, you know, providing $40 of utility by f- selling electricity is very, very hard to do for, you know, on that scale. But of course, now the batteries cost broadly $10,000. 
and they last 10,000 cycles. So what used to cost $40 now costs $1. And so I've had to rethink, and I'm now much more positive about vehicle to grid, much, much more positive than I used to be, which was not at all. <laughs> well, that's interesting. Well, I, in addition to the point you just made about the drop in battery prices, uh, you don't need a full battery cycle to get value from um, from a vehicle. I mean, a, 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 even a very, you know, a 10% of a cycle or 5% of a cycle can provide value for frequency regulation, for example, or, you know, or, or a relatively small percentage can help cut off a demand charge, um, uh, you know, a, an ex, a, a charge for excess use of electricity. So in, in, in a lot of places in the United States, at least, some of the biggest charges the businesses pay are for spikes in electricity. And if their fleets could handle that, instead, um, inst their vehicle fleets could handle that instead of having to draw power from the grid when there was a spike in electricity use, they could save a lot of money. Um, and uh, I, I think... I think that the initial adopters of this technology are highly likely to be commercial fleets. Um, and the best application here, by the way, are school buses. School buses are such an underutilized asset. You know, they, they are on the road for four or five hours a day at most. And otherwise they sit parked. And what if they could uh, earn money for the school district um, because they're an electric vehicle and they could be used as an energy storage asset while they sit unused. Uh, I think it's a tremendous opportunity. And, and, and that's true for a lot. Vehicles in general are un incredibly underutilized from a time of day standpoint. They're, you know, sitting part 90% of the time. Um, so this is an opportunity. Well, I mean, we, in our programs for, in our companies for Mata Energy, um, we have managed to fully pay for the lease costs of some of the vehicles with avoided demand charges and other, you know, uh, grid facing, um, you know, uh, payments or payments from the grid. Um, I, I think this is, you know, one potential benefit here, by the way, is, is making it once, once I think we have initial adoption through commercial fleets and this become rolls out more, this can be a way of making electric vehicles more affordable for low income and for moderate income uh, owners. I mean, that you can really reduce the cost of electric vehicle ownership with this. So I, I think there's huge potential here. I, I, would, I would agree with that. And I think I, I just smiled when you said school buses, because I have literally been banging on about school buses, I think, for 10 years or no? for the better part no. of 10 years. And it's brilliant because they are, of course, parked up doing nothing when the sun shines at the peak, right the way through the day, they don't do anything, most of them. And the amazing thing is, uh, you probably know how many school buses there are in North America. Do you, do you, do you know? I, I don't know the number. How many? It's 480,000 of them. It's an astonishing number. There's a lot of kids, it turns out. And um, there's, so there's nearly half a million school buses. And then they sit around. You could, as long as they were somewhere that you could plug them in, and, and, and soak up all that solar power during the day. And then, you know, in the evening, you know, after they've dropped off their chargers, then they are yeah, dropped off their chargers, get it? No, um, dropped off their pupils, they could then drop off their charge into the grid or into, a, into the school, into a, a home or whatever. That's fabulous. And again, we'll put a, we'll put a link into the show notes for Fermata, Fermata Energy, Fermata, what's it called? Fermata Energy. Fermata, Fermata Energy. Energy. There, there you go. Very good. Um, well, so it, we're, we're, we're almost out of time. Um, I'm going to ask you one final question, which is, um, you know, you've, you've got the, the US China, you've got the, the, your, your involvement in COPS, US China. Uh, we've talked about mineralization. We've talked about food and uh, agriculture. We've talked about um, the vehicle to grid. What, what are the other things that you wish, if you had more time, or maybe when you roll out of those things that you, you, you'll get involved in, what are some of the other big things that you just think, hmm, you know, this is not getting enough attention. I want to do some work on X. What is X? It's amazing you asked that question, Michael, because I've, I, 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 I've been thinking about exactly that. Uh, and, and I know th the answer is cryptocurrency. Uh, I, I think that... Um, and it's a topic that I've just started to wade into. Um, and so don't feel any real expertise, but I think it's gonna be quite important. Um, and I think it's gonna be important from an energy standpoint. It already is important from an energy standpoint. And it, it may well be important from a financial system standpoint. Um, and and um, uh, again, with the caveat that I really feel like I'm just starting to climb the learning curve on this. For those who are not familiar with this, um, Bitcoin now has, uh, almost if not over a trillion dollars of market capitalization. So it is not a trivial phenomenon, the Bitcoin phenomenon. Um, uh, there are a number of other cryptocurrencies out there. 
crypto the the energy the energy use electricity use in particular associated with bitcoin mining was so significant that bitcoin miners were just kicked out of china um, and you see varying statistics i'm not sure which i believe but i think there's a why there's an enormous amount of energy that's being used for bitcoin mining um, and i think there, there's a whole very strong community uh, that believes that cryptocurrencies are a um, fundamental uh, 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 threat to or will fundamentally transform the financial system. And you hear people say, we're at the same place with, with cryptocurrencies today that we were in the internet in the 1990s. I don't know whether that's true, but, but it's in, it, there, it, there's a lot, of, a lot of people who are uh, very expert in this stuff who are saying that. And actually just in the last couple of days, the, one of our major sports arenas in Los Angeles was just bought and is being named, I think, crypto.com. So there, and those sports arenas are not cheap. So anyway, so that's the topic that I think is not getting enough attention. I think it's important from an energy policy standpoint. There's, there's some strategies some companies have to try to use cryptocurrencies to actually help address climate change. Um, at, a, at a minimum, it needs to be thought of in terms of energy demand. So there's a lot there. And I'm curious, curious what, what your thoughts are on this topic, Michael. Well, so the funny thing is, I stood up in front of the Bloomberg NEF Summit in, uh, it's going to be 2016, perhaps. I think it was 2016, maybe 2017. And I said, Ethereum, smart contracts, forget Bitcoin, smart contracts. Here are all the different ways that you could use it for, you know, uh, um, carbon uh, registries, for, you know, wholesale uh, transactions. I'm not very keen on the peer-to-peer. I think that the transaction size relative to the energy cost of the transaction was too high. But I stood up and I did this whole thing and the audience was like, ooh, wow, you know, that sounds really uh, amazing. Isn't Michael smart, et cetera, et cetera. Except what I didn't do is take $1,000 or $10,000 and buy Ethereum or Ether yeah. or Ethers or Fs or whatever they whatever the I'm showing my ignorance here. But if I had bought ten thousand dollars worth, that would have been worth quite a few millions. So it turns out that I'm actually not that smart after all. Damn it! Yep. Um, but um, it, it's very difficult to interpret. I agree. There first, there's the energy uh, the energy used in crypto, which is clearly a big a big challenge. But you know, when you say things like, "Oh, well, it's a trillion dollars," of course. A trillion dollars never went into crypto, right? The the actual resources, the transfer of money in, whether it's people selling dollars and buying crypto, um, then of course there's somebody else who sold the dollars. But but the what's actually happened is some billions have gone in, maybe some tens of billions, and then then the 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 um, the, the the cryptocurrencies have been traded between people who trade them up and up and up and up and up to the point where there are a trillion dollars. But that doesn't, so it, it, you know, when it's not actually a trillion dollar market in the sense that somebody bought something for a trillion. That's not what happened. So it's that's, very that's, difficult that's true, but that's, that's true, but that's the same for the value of Tesla, right? Or for the value of Apple that it, that it just appreciated the, the, the value of the stock appreciated and it's now worth that much money. Correct. But there are people buying Teslas for tens of billions every year. And it's not clear to me what this crypto is actually being used for in the real economy. I mean, we all know about the dark, the dark web and what it's being used for in the nefarious space. But to what extent? And, and I suppose I have held back. I have no involvement, no investment. I've watched other people become very wealthy. You know, as I say, I'm, I myself failed miserably to time it right. But I want to see more interaction with the real economy. You could talk about it as a store of value and what they're doing in Nicaragua or wherever. But yeah. until somebody is buying that stuff, keeping it for 10 years and then selling it and buying a condo in Florida with it, and that all works nicely, I'm just finding it very hard to, you know, to, to sell my gold, which I don't have either. Um, but there you go. Well, it's it's the to, it's the important topic that I haven't spent the you know time on to th- that, that with the answer to your question. And, I'm also uh, fascinated by its uh, use in facilitating uh, and and reducing costs. And I heard of a great use case where um, you could put the oil being extracted from every little nodding donkey onto the blockchain, 
And then all of the different royalties, because there's the farmer gets some, and then there's the state that gets some, and, and so on. And all of that could be administered with no accountants being involved, which is always a good thing in my book. Uh, and so, you know, there are use cases where it really, really makes sense from an administrative cost perspective. So I, I, I'm fascinated. I look forward to hearing the results of your deep dive. Well, and with your financial expertise, Michael, I look forward to your further thoughts on this. And Very good. I see that as the our, our hour has progressed, the sun at my window has shifted, and I'm now getting a, a, quite a glow. So, uh, yeah. uh, you know, I, I'm not sure what that's a metaphor for, but uh, yeah, exactly. So we are, we are out of time. You are now backlit beautifully there. Yeah. I, I, you, you're right. The, the lighting has changed, but I think that is a sign that we are out of time. Um, David, it's just such an enormous pleasure always to talk to you. I'm so sorry that I missed you in uh, Glasgow. I hope that I can travel again to the US soon or that you will come back to Europe. And I very much hope to be meeting you in person. Thanks for having me, Michael. Great to see you as always. Thank you. Bye-bye. So that was David Sandelow, fellow at CIPA, the School of International and Public Affairs at Columbia University former acting U.S. Undersecretary of Energy. My guest next week on Cleaning Up will be Mariana Mazzucato, professor in the economics of innovation and public value at University College London, author of books like The Entrepreneurial State, The Value of Everything, and most recently, Mission Economy. Please join me this time next week for a conversation with Mariana Mazzucato. 